In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I have to admit, I had so much fun with this week's readings. You know, you always hope that they're related enough, that they overlap enough, that you can see some similarity between the different lessons, but I gotta admit, it usually doesn't happen, but it did this week, and the readings were absolutely fantastic. They fit so well together. The passages from Job, Psalm 107, and Mark all explore themes of listening to God's voice, responding to God's will, and the restoration that comes from a close relationship with the divine. I really love Job, or maybe I should say, I love the imagery used here, the picture of this conversation between God and a man, page after page telling of all of the incredible things that God has done. If you're not familiar with Job, let me go ahead and summarize the first 37 chapters. <laughs> really quick, I promise. Job is presented as a good man, so much that God was boasting about him with the devil. Satan is then given permission to test how faithful Job would be if he had to endure loss, grief, and pain. Satan then caused wave after wave of misfortune. Job's oxen and donkeys were plundered and some of his servants were killed. Then the sheep and the rest of his servants were burnt up in a freak fire. Then the house with all of his children collapsed, killing them all. And if that weren't enough, he then developed weeping open sores, which he performed surgery on himself using a shard of broken pottery. Then his wife comes to him and tells him to curse God and die. And then his three friends come and try to cheer him up. And that's where we come. They tell him that his misery is caused by divine justice, for all of his hidden sins. Job, however, declares his innocence. Worn out, he finally begs God for release from this earthly life. Now that the four of them have taken a breath, God can finally get in a word. And he starts with, so much talk, so little understanding. Then he gives Job two orders. Man, pull yourself together and answer my questions. I have a few for you too. 66 questions in total, exactly half of the 122 questions that Job asked God. He challenges Job directly, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Each question was full of power, beauty, and complexity. And it was a mix of a question and a command. We see anger, compassion, and just a little bit of sarcasm about Job's presumed wisdom. It's probably why I like it so much. We only hear part of it in today's lesson, just 11 short verses, but enough to get the idea. If you want more than a taste of it though, I highly recommend checking out Job chapters 38 through 41. It's an absolutely delightful passage. God takes the stage then and doesn't answer a single question. Their questions become almost meaningless as he begins to paint the picture of creation with questions to Job about stars and oceans. Job is captivated and realizes that his faith has been built on limited understanding. There is so, so much more than he could possibly ever understand. And he never really listened to God before either, like really listened. Their relationship changed as he learned how to not just speak, but to listen. When faced with all of the incredible things God has done, Job responds in the best way possible. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides, counsel with, that hides counsel without knowledge? 
Therefore, I have uttered what I did not know, things too wonderful for me that I did not understand. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you and declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of, my, of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Our next reading is Psalm 107, and it has some interesting similarities. Sailors, of many things that they need to know, they know a lot about water. They need to in order to navigate the depth of the water, the current, the weather, everything. They're masters of the water. But then God sends a storm, and after fighting for control of their vessel to the point of exhaustion, they finally give in and they turn to God. He guides them to safe harbor, and the psalmist reminds them to give thanks. This contrasts with Job's lesson of, lear of learning to experience God rather than simply knowing about God. That was Job's lesson. The lesson in our psalm is how often we do everything by ourselves until we've worn ourselves out before we turn, God to, be re turn to God to be rescued. And then we come to the gospel, the recounting of how Jesus stilled the sea in the face of his disciples' panic. Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind, we read, and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? His question so reminds me of the questions that God had for Job and the control and power of God that we saw in the Psalms. The disciples have maybe enjoyed the celebrity of being with Jesus, but they didn't really get him. They liked the miracles. It was pretty cool. There were all the healings. Everyone was talking about Jesus, but they didn't yet realize that he is God. He is God. And then the storm hits. And once they realize that the storm is bigger than all of their collective experience in the boat, they panic. They haven't yet learned to recognize Jesus' voice as God's voice. His control over the sea grabs their attention, and in time, they'll realize that Jesus is the same God who whipped up the storm in the psalm, and then Job told the sea, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stopped. These stories paint a vivid picture of our relationship with God. They expose our mistakes when we mistake intellectual understanding with knowing God, with genuine conne connection. But through our struggles, hope can emerge showing us a path to a deeper, more meaningful relationship. Ultimately, it reveals to us the very nature of God, a relational being who yearns, up, who yearns for us to experience God's presence in our lives. We often fall short like Job, knowing about God but not knowing God. God, as Job learns, wants our relationship to go both ways, and opening ourselves to God might be scary, but it offers us healing and restoration. Psalm 107 reflects us too. We try to go it alone, lean on our expertise, then when all hope seems lost, we finally cry out to God. It's like refusing to pull over and ask for directions when you're completely and utterly lost. If the goal is reaching the harbor, there's no shame in asking for help. Christ is there to guide us. We learn that God listens and leads us home, but also takes delight in our gratitude and shared love. The gospel is a reflection of us too. We learn about God, enjoy the connection, then ditch it in a crisis. We try to fi fix things alone, and we even get mad at God. In it, we see a God who's always present, even when seemingly tired or annoyed, 
and God wants us to be too. Our God is amazing, listening, speaking, and wanting relationships with us. One who loves and cares for us. Today we're confronted with our roadblocks, the, th the things that we carry with ourselves, relying on knowledge rather than experience, neglecting God until things are a disaster, and abandoning him in hardship. But God is always present in our pleasure and our pain. Today's lesson touches on our obstacles in connecting with God. Maybe it's time to move beyond knowledge and into a relationship. Can you hear God's word to the waves? Peace, be still. These words are meant for all of us. It's a call for a deeper connection to God. Amen.